slowly but surely, the academy, i.e. academia, universities, etc., etc., is catching up to the reality on the ground for both men and women regarding marriage. I say for both men and women because marriage, of course, takes two to tango. It takes both halves of the human species for it to work. And what I'm referring to here is a recent publication, and by recent I mean very recent, just the previous week in fact, that was released by one Daniel Lichter et al. from Cornell University. And I'll be posting a link to a publication summary as well as an article referencing it, although I cannot post a link to the full study because it's very, very difficult to extract in its totality. But the name of the study says it all, Mismatches in the Marriage Market. So what I'm going to do here is read off the article referencing it and then talk about some of the details and what is really going on here and what they're missing out on and then potentially some of the long-term predictions one might make based on this. So here's the article. One explanation for declines in marriage is a shortage of economically attractive men for unmarried women to marry. Indeed, a new study published in the Journal of Marriage and Family reveals a significant scarcity of such potential male spouses. The study's authors develop estimates of the sociodemographic characteristics of unmarried women's potential spouses who resemble the husbands of otherwise comparable married women. These estimates were compared with the actual distribution of unmarried men at the national, state, and local levels. Women's potential husbands had an average income that was about 58% higher than the actual unmarried men currently available to unmarried women, 58% higher. They also were 30% more likely to be employed and 19% more likely to have a college degree. The researchers found that racial and ethnic minorities, especially black women, face serious shortages of potential marital partners, as do unmarried women of either low or high socioeconomic status. And I'll more to say on that as well. Quote, most American women hope to marry, but current shortages of marriageable men, men with a stable job and a good income, make this increasingly difficult, especially in the current gig economy of unstable, low-paying service jobs, end quote. Quote, marriage is still based on love, but is also fundamentally an economic transaction. Many young men today have little to bring to the marriage bargain, especially as young women's educational levels on average now exceed their male suitors, end quote. So there's a lot to unpack here, I think. And what's interesting, I think, at first glance, and I actually looked at the full study in its publication, is that, as could be expected from mainstream academia, rigorous though it might be on occasion, they are looking at this from a skewed perspective. A true perspective, everything that was stated is technically true, but the phrasing of the language here, many young men have little to bring to the marriage bargain. The converse could be asked too, what do young women have to bring to the marriage bargain? Because it goes both ways, and it always cuts both ways. You cannot simply say, what do young men have to bring to the marriage bargain, without asking the other question, unless it's a tacit assumption, which it is here, that young women are essentially bringing a great deal. But, gentlemen, the question I would have to ask in the open is, what exactly is it that young women are bringing to the marriage bargain? We know, based on this study, that young men are not bringing economic vitality to the marriage bargain, and therefore not to be married, according to this. So what are women bringing to the table in this great transaction? And what I do like about this is that he does call it a transaction. All human relationships are transactional, and the relationship between men and women is highly transactional because we've had different reproductive pressures, selection pressures that have exerted their influence on us over the tens of millions of years as mammals, And that's where we end up today. So yes, it is transactional. And of course, he adds the snippet, still based on love, sure. And there's the aspect of attraction as well. But there's a lot going on here. So again, the first thing I would ask is, what is it that women are bringing to the table? We know that men are apparently, according to this, not economically viable. That's fair. This was a pretty rigorous study, as far as I can tell. So that's true. What are women bringing today? Well, traditionally, they brought, what, childbearing? 
uh, doing household chores, taking care of children, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Problem here is also that there are intangible qualities and aspects to a potential marriage that this is not taking into account and probably could not be quantified. For example, being pleasant to be around, being a person you actually want to spend time with, rather than the unfortunate, all too frequently encountered persona of many, many women these days, particularly young women. So there are difficulties in assessing what it would be that women would bring to the table in a quantitative sense. And fundamentally, the question is always, why is it they never ask what men want? Now, it is true, the gig economy and the severe instability of jobs in general, and a recession is coming sometime in the future, makes this very, very difficult for men indeed. And there are many, many men who are just fundamentally due to an unfortunate set of circumstances such as difficult family households, lack of looks, lack of cognitive power, et cetera, et cetera, who they're just never going to get there at all. And that's very unfortunate. But there's also a middle ground here that they're not talking about. And that is related to my first point, that if indeed men are not attractive prospects in terms of their economic status, why is it that they're not motivated, some of these men, to improve their economic status and to pursue these quote-unquote marriable women? Why are they not hauling ass and doing their best to improve their status so as to be as good marriage material as possible? That question is also not asked. And once again, this goes back to an unfortunate general observable tendency that you can't really quantify in the same sense as income, you can't do a study on this, that many, many women these days are simply intolerable to be around. They're not pleasant to talk to, they don't have anything interesting to say, and you just don't want to spend time with them. This simply is not being taken into account here. And I don't think we can really expect otherwise from a type of study like this. We can expect that going forward, they will talk more and more about this issue because it will become more and more apparent. It'll become much like a glaring and obvious wound that everyone can look at, and then they can all nod their heads in agreement and say, yes, that's a serious issue. They're always going to take the female perspective on this. They're not going to say, yes, women in an unquantifiable sense, are extremely unpleasant to deal with and unpleasant to be around. And that is also a contributing factor. Can I produce stats to prove that? Unfortunately, I can't. But many observations made in the manosphere over the past decade or two have essentially been true and are vindicated and supported by actual studies where we can look at stats and numbers in this case. And in that sense, I do believe that's ultimately true, that many, many women these days, particularly younger women, not pleasant to be around. You wouldn't want to spend time with them, let alone marry them. So yes, there are many men that are just not in a position to ever get married due to a combination of bad genes, bad luck, take your pick. But there are also men who, given the right application and assiduousness, could probably end up in a position where they're making enough money so as to be, quote unquote, marryable and yet they're not doing that. That's not a question that's asked. Of course, they also bring up what is seemingly a paradox, but is not an idea that unmarried women with both low and high socioeconomic status are facing challenges in finding partners. Low status because, yes, there's this issue with men, particularly working class men, that presents itself as being difficult to earn a sufficient income. High status because there are enough high status men to go around. But in the case of both mentally sound and physically sound men who are not participating and not wanting to get married, they're not posing the question, and perhaps that goes beyond the scope of the study, why these men don't want to get married. I've already proposed the idea that women fundamentally are just not very pleasant to deal with these days, and that is putting it mildly in some cases. But of course, the elephant in the room is the divorce system, how marriage works in general, and that will never be touched with a 10-foot pole. Why? Because it is an industry. It's a complex worth hundreds of billions of dollars. And because of that, they're not going to touch that. The reality is, and something that we all know by now, is that in terms of the legal ramifications, being a man and getting married, whatever your background might be, rich, poor, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, doesn't matter, you're putting yourself at tremendous risk 
getting married. That's undeniable. Even for people who think marriage is the best thing on earth, it's a very, very risky endeavor. And that, of course, being the elephant in the room, they're not going to talk about that. In addition to the other discrepancies and things that are just lacking in this publication. Now, to be fair, I understand that a proper study can only cover so much, and it has to limit itself, for obvious reasons, to the quantifiable. But when things are more qualitative, such as the nature of personalities, behavior, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it's very, very difficult to figure out what's going on there. And thus we're left to anecdotal observation, something that the manosphere is often accused of doing without producing proper studies, but what can you really do about that? The fundamental issue, which repeats itself constantly, is they're not looking at this from a bipartisan perspective. They're just saying men are insufficient. They're insufficient because whatever. They don't earn enough money. They don't have enough education. They don't have this, that. They're not asking the question that maybe men want something too, and they're not getting it either. Because we do have a hookup culture. For example, who would like to point out an official study that more and more women are highly promiscuous, and that is off-putting to many men in terms of long-term relationships or marriage prospects? Are they going to say that? No, because women have to be sexually liberated and they have to do what they want to do and they should be able to. But men, as always, have to man up. And so all this publication is really telling us is what we've already known. They're catching up to a marital reality that many of us have been observing for at least a decade and pointing out. And it's going to be slow going, but we'll hear more and more, I think, from academia in this regard. And as always, the finger will be pointed at men. It won't be a fair an equitable attempt looking at what men might be lacking, what women might be lacking. It's always going to be, men, you're not doing enough. Men, you need to effectively man up. And again, there are plenty of men who would quote unquote like to man up. But the question is, what is the reward for manning up? A horrible divorce, potentially? Risky, shaky marriages with women that are fundamentally unpleasant to be around? Young men have serious, serious sociocultural issues that nobody is talking about in this context. But I think it's always important to, every now and then, go over the basics, point out these things, because the mainstream will catch up ever so slowly, but they're going to catch up at their own pace. They're going to catch up in a language framed and couched in acceptable terms for them. They're not going to say that it takes two to tango and that the other tango partner might be just, if not even more lacking in many regards. As always, gentlemen, if I'm feeling hale and healthy and I'm still alive, more to come, as always, may the gods watch over you and enjoy the end of your week and your forthcoming weekend. Bye-bye. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.